Okay, happy World IBD Day, everyone. We are very excited to be here with a large group of IBD advocates from across the world. Around the globe, more than 5 million people live with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, known collectively as inflammatory bowel diseases. My name is Rebecca Kaplan, and I am the Public Affairs and Social Media Manager for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation in the United States, and I'll be moderating today's chat. IBD diagnosis, treatment, and care varies greatly by country. For example, in the US, more than 1.6 million Americans live with these incurable, debilitating digestive diseases. While there are 300,000 people in the UK with IBD, 250,000 in Canada, and 75,000 in Australia. IBD treatments that are available in some countries may not be available in others. So in observance of World IBD Day, we're excited to convene the first ever international YouTube live chat with representatives from partner organizations to discuss how we are uniting to care and cure IBD around the world. So today I'm joined by a great panel of folks, including Michael Oso, the president and CEO of the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation in the US, David Barker, chief executive of Crohn's and Colitis UK, Kiara Drohan, Crohn's patient from Ireland and secretary of the European Federation of Crohn's and Ulcerative Colitis Associations. Matthew Herrera, an ulcerative colitis patient from Louisiana and a member of the foundation's National Council of College Leaders. Angie Spesek, vice president of marketing and communications for Crohn's and Colitis Canada. And Dr. Flavio Steinwurz, founder and president emeritus of ABCD, located in Brazil. And I will let him pronounce that for you later because I do not speak Portuguese. So if you're following along, please comment, tell us who you are, where you're from, and ask questions. We're going to get to as many as we can during this next hour, and I want to get us started as quickly as possible. So I want to throw this out as an opening question to everyone on the call. What is it like to be a patient diagnosed with IBD in your country? Flavio, let's start with you. Okay, Rebecca, you know, uh, in our country, as I guess in everywhere, by the time that a patient receives the diagnosis of IBD, and he doesn't have many information about, and he receives the diagnosis of a chronic incurable disease, of course, they become very worried. There is a lack of information of those diseases here in Brazil and I think everywhere. And you don't see people around you talking about the diseases. So when you have the symptoms of IBD, you for sure believe that you never get better if it's incurable. And you never think that you're gonna have a normal life. So it's very important to become confident on the treatment and to form a team with your healthcare professionals in order to believe in your improvement and to uh, believe that you're going to have a normal life if you treat well. Great, Matt, let's go over to you. Yeah, well, just kind of echo, uh, echo off of what Dr. Dr. Ted, um, it is a very confusing and overwhelming time, especially if you're a younger patient. I was diagnosed when I was five years old. I remember you know, just kind of being scared and not really knowing what to expect when you know, we have doctors wanting you to take all these medicines and do all these maybe uncomfortable procedures a little bit. But um, you know, it's important to kind of surround yourself with people who, are, who care a lot about you and who are looking out for you, um, no matter how old you are. Um, but you know, when a doctor tells you that you have a, a chronic illness or a disease, it's it's definitely something that you naturally want to worry about. And it makes you feel like you maybe don't have any control over what's going on, and you maybe not know what to expect down the line or at, at the time being. As a patient, it's important to ask questions and to be responsive and open to learning about the disease and and learning about you know, how you can handle it as a patient. I encourage with people to always be active in their diagnosis and be your own advocate. Um, because it can be difficult no matter how old you are. Um, so, you know, it's important to be active, not only as a patient, but as caregivers, and to ask questions and be um, your own advocate, like I said. Great. Uh, Kiara, what about you? I think I became diagnosed with Crohn's when I was 18, and I think there was a sense of relief, because suddenly I knew what was wrong. Uh, so for so many, it takes so long to be diagnosed. 
And I think there's a level of frustration then because there's so much, as Matt said, there's so much information coming at you that you just don't know where to go. Um, and I suppose the support from others is, is huge. And we find that across the whole of Europe. Um, and I suppose for me personally, at 18, I'm kind of, there's new beginnings, but now I've started a whole new journey of life. Um, and it's, it's changed me. Um, but I suppose it just makes you stronger and more determined. Um, on your new course of life and your new journey but it's such a challenging time um, when you're first diagnosed and the, the awareness people don't realize what it is um, and then people just realize well you change your diet and you'll be fine um, and they don't realize it's chronic there is no cure and you have to start and it's a roller coaster I'm sure Matt finds that it's a constant constant roller coaster um, of emotions and of symptoms as well Great. I'm going to hop over Michael. I know that Matt spoke a lot already about the U.S., but what have you seen generally for the patients? Yeah, I would uh, first I would echo what everyone else has shared. Um, everything that was shared is certainly true in the U.S. I think um, in the U.S. And, and perhaps in other countries, there is fairly significant uh, variety in the level and quality of care that is received. So um, in the U.S., again, it depends on where you're diagnosed and who your clinician is, your uh, treatment regimen, and the entire care for your journey could look very different from state to state and community to community. So that can be confusing and difficult for our patients. Um, and then there's also uh, a large degree of severity inside the diseases. Um, and some people present with very mild disease and others present with very severe disease. And even that level of difference can be challenging and confusing for folks and even for doctors as they're treating their patients. So, um, and I think maybe the last thing I would add is that, you know, these are at least at the moment, they are chronic lifelong conditions that are incurable. Um, and we hope to change all of that in the not too distant future. But the reality of a lifelong chronic illness that doesn't have a cure um, really can take its toll on patients and their emotional and psychosocial reaction to that uh, can, can drive a lot of how they deal with the disease. So. Let's uh, go back across the ocean to David. Uh -huh. okay. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So, so I think in answer to your question, what's it like for a patient to be diagnosed with IBD? I think probably pretty tough. I mean, as I don't think there, this crosses. Um, this, this will be the same in every country that you know patients. I'm sure will go through the full range of emotions. I'm not a patient myself, but I have the privilege of speaking to many, many patients on a daily basis. And whether it's the sort of worry of, uh, as Kiara says, you know, is it cancer? thank God I've just actually found out what it is. And then the range of emotions about the fact they've got a chronic condition, they've got it for life, the confusion that will come away with that, whether they're concerned about the impact of it on their life, their work. And that support and information is absolutely critical. And that's why I think organizations like the ones represented here this evening are so important. The other thing I would just say is, and again, I'm sure this is, is no different in your countries as it is in the UK, is the challenges of talking about it. These are invisible conditions, they're embarrassing. No one likes to talk about their bowels um, or living by the fact that you know, you're know you worried about the next toilet, where the next toilet is. So the power of the community, I think, I've worked in other disease areas and I've seen in, in IBD, um, that power of the community coming together to support one another is really, really important. And I think that through that community, um, that actually helps uh, patients um, who are diagnosed with these conditions. All right, and last but certainly not least, Angie, what is it like for patients in Canada? Uh, it's very consistent to what um, I heard from around the globe. Um, the only thing I would add is for many people, because the diagnosis can take place um, around the ages of 19 and 35, a lot of times this is a very um, important period in, in a person's life. They might be going to university or college, they might be um, out of the home. And for a lot of people, they feel very alone and isolated. And a lot of that is because people um, don't talk about it. And, um, you know, it's it, the support is huge. Finding a community, finding others that have the disease and being able to, to talk about it is, is huge. And that's why 
uh, it's so important to do things uh, like we're doing today. And um, the second point is that um, the progression of the disease um, is so different among individuals. And for some, it may start off slowly. And because um, they don't necessarily know what it, it means, the impact is not always widely known. Um, there, there's a thought that, hey, I can control this. Um, you know, if, if I change how I live or my diet, um, maybe I can overcome this. Very quickly, there's a tipping point, typically, that um, will uh, trigger a realization that I can't control this. It's not mind over my body. Um, I actually can't control this. Uh, they may be hospitalized. There's a realization that um, something has to change and that this is a lifelong condition without a cure. Um, and getting to a point of stability is so important for individuals uh, because you'll we'll see a withdrawal from things, the typical things that a, 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 you know, a person will do, a withdrawal from, from things like work or school or going out. And, and again, that's why getting to a proper diagnosis, a proper level of treatment that is very individual is very important for our community. Great. And I want to ask a follow-up to our two patients, to Kiara and Matt. What do you guys think is the biggest hurdle that patients face in their care? Uh, Kiara, let's start with um, I think. Oh, or Matt. I'll go first. All right. Um, I think the biggest thing, the biggest problem that I face personally is kind of just adjusting to the lifestyle. Um, and Because IBD is a way of life. It's something that you kind of, uh, that can kind of embody you at times. And it's something that you have to, live with through every decision that you make, um, whether that's, you know, the drugs you take and, you know, being consistent in the drugs you take. So just learning how that lifestyle works can be hard. It took me a long time to figure that out. I mean, I was diagnosed younger, but, you know, growing up, I had more about you know, how I had to handle it, how I had to cope with it. Daily regimen and being consistent in your routine can definitely be a challenge, um, as, as long as, as well as the uh, associated with the disease and how they take a toll on your body mentally how they affect you so learning how to handle all that is definitely a, a huge hurdle as a patient um embarrassing side of the disease that like was said earlier that every patient encounters and so you know just learning that that process and, and how to adjust to that i think is the biggest challenge challenge as a patient Yeah, I, I agree with Matt, but I, I think it's just that it's, it never remains the same. Every time you think you've sorted an aspect of it and got it stabilized, it changes again. Um, and it's just, I know I said it earlier, but it's just a constant roller coaster. And I, I think the ignorance towards the disease, because I look fine and I'm sure, okay, most people tuning in are probably patients, but people I meet in everyday life, I don't look sick. Um, and that's a huge I suppose psychological issue to take on that people don't realize you're as sick as you are and there's days where you have to fight to get out of bed there's days where your medication takes effect but you still have to try and continue on uh, and you want to crawl up in a ball and hide but you can't because you look fine there's nothing visibly wrong with you um, and for me like no matter how much makeup I put on whatever it's still going to be there um, and that's a challenge and I think trying to adjust to that um, is a huge hurdle to get over um, and the fact that it's like the worst ever roller coaster you've been on sometimes it's not exactly fun and um, but you just learn to live with it because you have no choice you've no matter what medication you still have no choice because it's always there and the same with you see it's always there in the back of your mind that it's going to come again or it's going to change and um, but we do what we do uh, because I suppose we're patients and we get on with it. Um, but it's, it's a massive hurdle. And the lack of awareness, because it's, it is true that it is such an invisible disease, um, because we all look fine. Matt, you look fine, I look fine, um, and, but we're both patients. Thanks, Karen. That's actually a great lead into the next question I have for the group. So we know that living with IBD places a huge burden on some, a patient's emotional health and quality of life. So how are psychosocial issues incorporated into patient care in your country? And uh, David, let's start with you. 
Um, so I think the, the answer is pretty clear to that, not well enough by a long shot in the UK, and that may well be the same in your countries as well. But as, as you will all know, you know, for many people, they're not just having to deal with, you know, some very challenging uh, medical uh, implications and treatments of these conditions. But for many, the, the greater battle can often be the psychological and the emotional impact. And to be frank, in this country, we're nowhere near where we need to be in terms of the support that available. What I would say is in this country, we, um, we have an amazing team of IBD specialist nurses. We have nowhere near enough of them. They're all overworked, but they can go a really long way in beginning to help people with some of those sort of emotional supports. They're not trained psychologists, but they can go a long way to be a shoulder to cry on for someone to share their experience with. So I think, you know, the IBD specialist nurses are really key, which is why our organization has, has launched a major campaign last year to ensure that we get more of them. And I think the other thing I'd come back to on that is the power of the community. I see people draw real strength from um, speaking, hearing, listening to what other people are experiencing. And that power of community, whether it's through Facebook, whether it's through things like this, whether it's through our Walk It program or where people will come together, can actually plug a really massive gap that um, we see in this country in terms of clinical support for the psychological and emotional um, impact of these conditions. Great. Kiara, what about in Ireland and elsewhere across Africa? In Ireland, a bit like to echo David, uh, we have limited IBD nurses, and I think that's a problem probably throughout globally, and not just in the UK and Ireland. Uh, European-wise, it was interesting, EFCA did a survey on, I suppose, the impact of IBD on your life, not so much the medical side of it. Um, and at that stage, you had 27% of patients had to map their journeys so that they could find a toilet along the way. So while 27 might seem quite low from a statistical point of view, you're talking 27% of IBD patients can't leave the house until they know how their journey and where they're going. And that's hard. You know, you can't go anywhere unless you know you can stop somewhere along the way to go to the toilet without an issue. Um, like I suppose in Ireland and like many European countries, there's not as accessibility to toilets as there should be. And um, you look at it is that I suppose we don't have the psychological support either um, and that is but I agree with Dave the community is a huge your IBD community you can gain so much support um, and when you're having a bad day your community don't judge you and um, that they understand that it's up and down but they don't judge you and they'll speak in layman's terms when you're frightened and they'll soothe you and support you and throughout the whole of Europe we find that is a massive influence on patients is to find somebody who you know, is going through the same thing as you or can say to you, look, head up, you'll get over it, you'll get through it and you'll move on. Um, and I suppose, you, again, back to that survey, you look at, at that stage, 40% of patients had issues with intimate relationships. Um, and back to, I suppose, what Angie said is that when you're looking at somebody who's 19 to 35 being diagnosed, intimate relationships can be a huge part of that. Um, and people just, you, you're not provided with the support for that. Um, so... Great. Michael, what about in the U.S.? The impact of these diseases is really significant. Um, we see it all the time, and we also see that most gastroenterologists and the clinicians that are treating patients are not themselves equipped to deal with the psychosocial elements of the disease. And oftentimes uh, our patients are not encouraged or even referred to um, psychiatric support and help. And so we recognize that it's a huge issue. It's, it's compounding the severity and the challenges of the disease, especially when they're not addressed. Many of our patients deal with crippling uh, psychosocial issues like anxiety and depression and even guilt and feelings of loneliness and certainly the intimacy issues um, that we're talking about, all of these things uh, can be crippling for our patients. So um, we at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, we've taken it upon ourselves to really try to do something to assist in that area. And so um, it's actually a big part of our new strategic plan that we just launched in January of this year 
to bring a specific focus to psychosocial issues and develop education and support programs and activities to address it very specifically. We just launched a video series featuring a gastroenterologist and a psychologist and a patient uh, to bring awareness both on the patient side and on the provider clinician side to the very serious need on the psychosocial front. Um, I think there's enormous uh, potential benefit to our patient population the more we can bring attention to these issues. Great, and Angie, how about in Canada? Uh, very similar to what I've, I've heard. Um, I, I think it's also important to note that the emotional um, impact is also felt on the caregiver side. Um, so not only is it affecting the people living with the disease, uh, parents with young children um, are going through a huge amount of different emotions, guilt, understanding, um, depression, stress. And so we're doing a number of things here in Canada. Um, we, we also feel that um, there needs to be more done within the medical environment and we're starting to see some of the IBD uh, centers uh, looking at uh, treatment more, more holistically, but it's certainly uh, the exception, not necessarily the normal um, to, to deal with the emotional side of the disease and the education. So at Crohn's and Colitis Canada, we have a number of educational um, programs that help uh, with the emotional uh, support side of living uh, with the disease. Uh, everything from webinars and brochures and content. Uh, we also have a gutsy peer support program where we connect individuals living with the disease uh, with like individuals who have the disease through an online forum and they can talk about things on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis uh, to help support each other. And at a local level, um, having chapters and uh, community events provide uh, such amazing benefits. Uh, it's just huge when um, the local community gets together, uh, folks living with the disease or wanting to help support the community living with the disease. Uh, at a local level, having education nights, chapter meetings, events, uh, all focused on helping the community. Great, and I love that you mentioned caregivers because aside from being a foundation employee, I am actually the spouse of a Crohn's patient and everyone in our office hears me talk a ton about caregivers, so I always love to hear someone else talking about it as well. So Flavio, what is it like in Brazil in terms of the social cycle serv psychosocial services that are provided for patients? You know, as Michael has already said, uh, psychosocial issues represent really a big challenge to the patients and even to the staff, to the medical staff or to the professionals that take care of those patients. Uh, we, uh, as Chiara has said already, also we, we have a limited number of dedicated nurses in Brazil despite having many excellent centers to treat patients with IBD. Fortunately, we have many volunteers, psychologists, and nutritionists. And since 99, we are having these peer groups, I mean, these self-help groups, when we have people with the same disease debating and changing experiences. And usually we have uh, one psychologist and also one nutritionist to help them to raise questions about psychosocial issues and nutritional issues. So, but it's really something very difficult and I guess, I guess we have to do it uh, more and more in order to uh, get benefits to the patients. So is the consensus of this group that there's not enough awareness about the psychosocial impact on IBD yet? Actually, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I would just, I would say a, a very definitive yes to that question. There, uh, There's a lot more we can be doing to both understand the real impact that psychosocial issues have on the patient, uh, to bring awareness to both the clinician and patient community around it, and to put strategies in place to really help address it on all those fronts. 
Great. So let's move on to research. I know that research in IBD around the world is booming. We've got a lot of great discoveries that have happened, drugs in the pipeline. I feel like every day there's a new research study being published. So let's talk a little bit about what has been the biggest research advancements in your country from the last few years. And Kiara, let's start with you. Um, I suppose in Ireland we're quite small. We're tiny <laughs> um, and even our statistics in relation to patients is quite low. So I'll talk if it's okay about EFCA in relation to because we represent 33 countries um, and patient organizations. And one thing that we've really worked hard on over the last few years, which I suppose possibly digresses slightly from technical research is biologics versus biosimilars. Um, and patient safety has been a huge focus for us in relate and recently has led us on to looking at Europe as a whole and what each country can provide to patients and what is the protocol in each country. And it's, it's frightening to see the differences. Um, but we've done, I suppose, continuing to work on patient safety and looking at biosimilars, biologics, um, because a lot of patients think they're the same. Um, and I suppose it's getting a, an awareness and an education to patients out there about the medication. So that's what we've done a lot while it's not technically research. And um, we've done a lot of work on that and we will continue to do a lot of work on that and continue on our project about mapping out uh, what's available for patients in each country to try. And that will help us advocate um, with, a with better data in, in the sense that we can go to policymakers and say, this is what's happening around Europe um, and forcing IBD onto the diaries and agendas of powerful people uh, to try and improve things. Rebecca, you're very tired. <laughs> Telling you, Day on the Hill, which we're gonna talk about next, killed my energy. Um, let's actually go to Flavio in Brazil. What kind of research is happening? We, we are having you know, right now in Brazil, many, many researches on the field of IBD, from basic science to clinical trials, but I guess the most important thing is that we are starting to do something in epidemiology. Since the incidence and prevalence of IBD in Brazil is increasing a lot lately. So we are doing a lot of epidemiological studies and I have a special attention in a place in the center of the country, which is a city called Goiânia, that is having a big raising in the incidence of IBD. So something is going on there. And I'm talking to many epidemiologists around the world to try doing something in, in order to discover what's happening there that the incidence is raising so much. That's really interesting. About how many patients are there in Brazil with IBD? Do you have a statistic around that? Yeah, actually not. Actually not. I have in my institution 1,600 patients with IBD, which is just a private institution, just in my clinic. But I, uh, we believe we have something around 100,000 people. Got it. All right. Michael, how about in the U.S.? Obviously, I know a lot about the research work that we're doing, but what do you think has been the biggest advancement in the last few years? Yeah, um, we're very proud of a paper that just got published in The Lancet, um, and it's uh, uh, around a research project in the pediatric community. Uh, it's called the Pediatric Risk Stratification Study, and essentially this is a study that's been going on for about eight years, uh, recruited about 1,800 pediatric patients, um, about 1,100 of those 1,800 were uh, followed longitudinally and uh, uh, it was discovered that they had Crohn's disease. Um, and essentially, and I should point out also that there were 28 centers around North America that were part of this study. 25 of them were in the US, but three of them were in Canada. Um, so it was a, an international collaboration, which was terrific. And the aim of that study was to identify predictors of severity. So these were all kids that were um, 
brought into study upon the diagnosis and onset of the disease, so they didn't have any prior treatment when they were enrolled into the study. Um, and essentially, the, the study was able to predict which patients would go on to have severe disease, either uh, penetrating and fistula disease or stricturing and fibrosis. And uh, the wonderful thing about the paper and the study is that we are poised to develop a real diagnostic tool now that will help both physicians, of course, and patients understand what the risk at diagnosis is for future complications, and then to be able to make uh, treatment recommendations and follow a protocol according to that prediction. So we're very, very proud of that, uh, that study and the publication and the work that lies ahead. And I just want to say to Flavio, if it's okay to add this as well, is that we struggle with the lack of good epidemiology studies in the United States as well and are constantly trying to push for better epidemiology studies because we don't really understand, even in the United States, what the true incidence of the disease is and where there's increased risk or less risk uh, across um, what, which demographics and which ethnicities, and there's a huge need for it. So. Great, and David, how about in the UK? So I think as, as we, all, we all know, the, there's a lot of work still to be done. Um, in the UK, we're very proud as Crohn's and Colitis UK to support a, quite a wide variety of research work actually and I was just talking to uh, one of the researchers in this country Charlie Lees um, today who's he's leading a study called the predict study in the UK which is really interesting which is looking at people in remission they're recruiting people in remission to understand what creates a, a flare-up but I think some of the other work that we've we funded or supported through some of the funding that we've given um, some very exciting work that's happening in Cambridge under a gentleman called Dr Miles Parks um, creating an IBD bioresource. Um, they're looking to recruit 25,000 people to that biobank, and it's going to be the first biobank we have in the, you know, in the United Kingdom. Um, patients are asked to give a small blood sample. Clinical data is taken. It was launched back in 2015, and it will be the first biobank that will actually offer the full genomics sequencing. So that's potentially very exciting, I think. Um, there's some other genetic work also happening in Cambridge. Um, looking at the sort of gene variants around the severity of the disease. That's led by someone we support called Dr. James Lee. Um, some interesting work in Liverpool about the microbiome. Um, you know, obviously a huge area of investigation there. And I think as well as some quite basic science, some, some really interesting stuff happening up in Glasgow, actually in Scotland, around paediatrics and just some really sensible, practical research around dental nutrition and how can... Um, as we all know, that's a real challenge for children who are on liquid diets for so long. So how can they make them more palatable? How can they take the nutritional benefit out of them and actually enable young people to live as relatively normal sort of diet uh, life, sitting down, being able to eat with their parents, for example. So really some really practical and sensible work that could make a difference. It's not going to bring us the cure, but actually it will help people live um, with the challenges of um, these conditions um, day in, day out. So, you know, a full range of uh, projects that are going on. One of the things we were talking, I was talking to um, uh, about today was, uh, is there enough international collaboration, for example? And it's great that we've got, you know, representatives from across the world here. And actually, the, the guys I was talking to today said, actually, that there is some good collaborations going on across the world, which is really reassuring. I'm sure there could always be more. Um, and maybe if one of the things that that comes from things like this and you know we're, it's amazing what we can do now through the power of YouTube or Twitter or that collaboration um, to encourage that more because we are all in this for the same end game so the more we can collaborate the more we can maybe look at funding big you know pieces of work that can make a significant difference the better and and you know at Crohn's and Colitis UK we're really up for that kind of uh, thinking we're just in the process of having a really good look at our research strategy as part of a bigger strategic piece of work we're doing for the next five years. So it's interesting times, but as we all know, um, a significant uh, amount still to do. Great, and Angie, what's going on in Canada? So research is a huge part of what we do here in Canada. Uh, since our founding, we've 
invested over 100 million in research, looking at things that help advance discoveries, improve treatments, improve quality of life. But I think we all agree that um, we're not gonna rest until we find the, the cures for these diseases. And um, while knowledge has improved and understanding has improved, there's still a lot to be done. One of the uh, projects that we're particularly proud of is the GEM study, and it's a it's a study that's led out of Toronto, but it involves centers around the globe, recruitment centers around the globe, and what it's looking at, and I think we're getting close to ten years now, um, is uh, what we're looking at is the genetic, environmental, and microbial impact um, association with the disease, and the study um, has uh, involves healthy siblings and parents of individuals that have the disease with the view that some of them will go on to get Crohn's disease. And um, this is the first study that has looked at someone over a, a longer period of time to see what has changed in their makeup before they get the disease and, and what does it look like once they have the disease. There's close to 5,000 individuals in the study um, I believe our last count was there was about 60 that had gone on to get, uh, you know, the disease. And so we're at an interesting point of this particular study to start looking at and doing analysis of the samples that have been taken over time and looking at this with experts from around the globe. Um, so, yeah, um, but along that, we, we have hundreds of studies underway and um, like I said, research is a big part of what here in Canada, in Crohn's and Colitis Canada, invests in with a view to absolutely try to find the cures. I love hearing about all of this exciting research that's going on, especially, as I said, because my husband's a patient and the closer we get to cures, the happier that I'm going to be. And I know the happier that everyone watching is going to be. So we're about halfway through today's chat and I just want to remind people who are watching Comment, let us know who you are, where you're from, and please ask questions. We're going to have some time available at the end, and we want to get to your burning questions. This is your opportunity to talk to people from around the globe about IBD, so don't miss out. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit about advocacy. So I know around the globe, IBD patients are affected by a variety of advocacy issues, including high cost of care, access to care, and much more. Much more. So for the UK, the US, and Canada, I wanted to ask David, Angie, and Michael, what are you currently advocating on for on behalf of your patients? And Michael, let's start with you, given yesterday's activities and the reason that I am yawning today. Sure, uh, happy to start. Um, and for those who haven't heard this yet or are just joining us, uh, the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation annually um, in Washington, D.C. hosts what we call our Day on the Hill event. And it's a time when we bring patients and other volunteers from across the country to Washington, D.C. to meet with our congressional leaders and bring forth the legislative priorities that are most important to our patient community. Um, and in our strategic plan, again, and in our daily activities, and certainly in Day on the Hill, we're talking a lot about the access to care and, of course, the ever-increasing cost of care. Um, for those who may know, there's a lot of conversation um, around healthcare in this country and healthcare reform um, with the the recent debate around the benefits um, and challenges of the Affordable Care Act here in the United States and the new American Health Care Act, uh, we feel that it's very, very important that people who have pre-existing conditions maintain the very, very important patient protections uh, that, that they now have. and regardless of what that reform looks like, it's important to us that those um, pre-existing protections, because all of our, every single one of our Crohn's and colitis patients has a pre-existing condition, and we feel strongly that we must advocate aggressively to protect uh, the, the, the protections that are in place. 
Um, the other thing that's important to us, the two other things quickly is um, to increase the amount of federal funding that goes to research in general, scientific research in general, and certainly IBD research specifically. There's, there's still a huge need and lots of important work that isn't happening because of lack of funding. Um, and lastly, quickly, because uh, there are many commercial payers in the United States, some of which have step therapy policies in place, uh, those policies, those insurance policies require patients to fail certain medications first before they're allowed to go on the medication that the physician and patient have decided is most important to them. And so we're aggressively advocating at the state level and federal level um, to put protections there in place and uh, prevent unnecessary step therapy policies from being in place and at least allow for an appeals process um, so that patients can bring forth their particular concerns if they have them. And Matt, I know you were at our day on the Hill this year. Do you have anything you want to add about the experience and what it's like to do this kind of advocacy as a patient? Yeah, I mean, this is my second year doing it. And um, it's always such a cool experience and, and such a really neat way to learn about your disease and, and advocate for your disease. Walk around and meet with legislators and their offices and you know, talk about these issues that were important to us and kind of affect that direct change into our community. Um, and it's, it's, it's always a blast and, and, you know, it's always an eye-opening experience for me. Um, so I had a great time and I'm looking forward to going back again next year. So Angie, what advocacy issues are you guys working on in Canada? We have a couple. Um, uh, same, um, I, you know, the, uh, the issues I think are same, the same around the globe and, and part of it is the uh, as Kara mentioned, the roller coaster nature of the disease. So um, patients um, may respond to a, a treatment and medication one day and find it fail the next day. What works for one individual may not work for another. And I think there's a real lack of awareness at a public and a private payer perspective that um, this is a chronic disease. And what we really have to do is expand the availability of safe treatments across the globe um, in a very consistent way so that, uh, that the person can get to a point of stability with the treatment that works for them and not be forced to be off of a treatment you know, for cost reasons alone because all of a sudden it's no longer listed or supported. So we have an active campaign underway right now. We call it No Force Switch. Uh, we had a letter writing campaign that went to government officials um, and, and basically it was advocating that, um, you know, not forcing someone to go off of a, a medication that was working for them um, based on cost reasons alone, that a person that has a, a drug or a treatment or a therapy that's working for them should be able to maintain it. We actually had 4,500 letters written to government officials. We saw some change um, on the East Coast in terms of recognition of those letters and actually driving change within the province, which was huge. And we'll continue to advocate for the need to expand the um, availability of safe treatments. So to expand the list, which includes biologics and biosimilars and, and all treatments that um, will work you know, for a patient with the view that, um, you know, again, um, People may go through many different types of medications in their lifetime, um, and having more available options is better um, in, you know, in the community, the IBD community. The second uh, uh, thing that we're advocating for is washroom access, which is huge. And we all know that uh, many people get turned away from retailers, and we've heard the stories. Someone's tried to go in and use a washroom um, with an urgent need, and they were turn, turned away. So we think it's really important that um, there's an, ac an ac accommodation, um, you know, at retailers and businesses and, you know, any washroom, that it's open for individuals with incontinence issues, that they don't have to try to describe, you know, this, this disease that they have because they don't appear to be sick. And in fact, um, the need could be a medical emergency. And so we hear too often that people are turned away. So we have an initiative called Go Here, which um, um, increases the visibility of friendly washrooms, but
but also um, encourages businesses to open their doors and uh, government facilities to open their doors to um, to individuals with incontinence issues. That's great, and I know that in the U.S. that's definitely a concern. We hear a lot from patients as well around restroom access. So I'm going to go across the ocean back to the U.K. And David, what advocacy issues are you guys working on? Uh, so quite a few, and they range from sort of uh, issues where we're talking to the heart of our government here around uh, access to treatments. In the U.K., we have something called NICE, which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. They make the decisions really and the recommendations on drugs that should be allowed in terms of cost. So we are there um, making sure that we have patient representation. The power of the patient voice across all of these advocacy issues is absolutely critical. And we've seen some, some real successes, particularly on ensuring that uh, patients have access to some of the emerging biological treatments um, because NICE will decide on whether they are cost efficient and cost effective for you. So, so there's issues around access to treatments that we will work on on behalf of patients. In terms of mobilizing the sort of power of our patient voice, um, other things that we do around driving quality improvement programs. Um, we have a national health service in the UK. Um, you may, I'm sure, have heard of stories. It is in crisis. There is no money. So how do we actually get more for less uh, is the constant sort of mantra. And patients have a really significant part to play in driving um, that. The power of the patient voice, it sits really at the heart within some of the, the, the key plans within the National Health Service in these, um, both Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, Wales and, and England. Um, there's a phrase that was used a number of years ago, no decision about me without me. And that really is making sure that patients are involved in helping to deliver their uh, the quality of their care. I chair something in the UK called the IBD Standard Group, which brings together all of the clinician, the organisations, the Royal Colleges, um, the surgeons, the dietitians, the GPs. Um, and that's been a real powerhouse, actually, for driving up standards of care. And um, we've been very privileged to be able to lead that initiative because we can always be the critical friend. We will always be able to say, well, this is what patients need. So that's really important for us. And then just to pick up on um, one specific within that, I mentioned nurses earlier. We've had a really excellent campaign going for nurses, again, which patients have been at the heart of writing to the chief executives of local trusts to shout about the importance of nurses and the importance of nursing provision. And we're seeing some real successes on that. Final thing I wanted to say was picking up on what uh, they're doing in Canada. So. Um, access to toilets has been a real key issue for our members. We've got 32,000 members in the UK. All of them um, have had experience of either going into what has traditionally been called a disabled toilet or an accessible toilet in this country. They're not seen to be in a wheelchair. As we know, these are invisible conditions and then they're berated when they're walking out. So we've had some really exciting successes um, over the last few months with a campaign called Not Every Disability is Visible. Um, and we're changing um, the toilet signage on, on, on toilets across the United Kingdom. And we've had real success with our major supermarket brands, the four main supermarket outlets who are changing all of their toilets to ensure that there is uh, a sign on the door that recognizes that actually you don't have to be a wheelchair and not every disability is visible. And that, of course, doesn't just benefit patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. That benefits anyone who has um, issues and, and they need a loo. But that has been driven by the power of our patients. And we've seen thousands of notes, letters being written to chief executives of supermarkets. And that's a campaign that we're looking um, to roll out even further. Football clubs in the United Kingdom are starting uh, airports. Uh, and that's something that globally, I think we could probably all take up. And it was driven by a, an amazing idea from a young lady um, in Scotland uh, called, um, uh, who started a campaign to get the um, these issues going and it's a campaign that we've been really able to pick up and drive and we're seeing some really exciting successes so a whole range of uh, areas that we're advocating on but all driven by the power of patients. Yeah I remember reading the stories about the girl from Scotland who was working on this and it's so great seeing kids getting involved in advocacy nowadays. Grace Warnock she's an amazing young lady she's uh, she's a real powerhouse and has taken a sort of a uh, you know, like all these things, a simple idea that can make a significant difference. And uh, Grace is an amazing young lady, but with the 
you know, we have uh, the benefit of, of 32,000 members. We've been able to put the power of Crohn's and Colitis UK behind it. And from that initial idea that Grace has done and, and is continuing to do, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about the future of that campaign. And it's something we will continue to invest in because it is something that sits dear to the heart of, of anyone affected by these conditions. So to have access to um, an accessible toilet without having a funny look or being berated or, or being abused uh, uh, after using them is, is really, really critical and a practical thing that can help many, many thousands of people. Yeah, I know in the US, the Restroom Access Act was first brought up and passed also by a young girl who's actually now a law school graduate, who's a federal judge clerk, but I just love seeing all these things starting with kids. So we have about 10 minutes left and I wanna to pivot to why we're all here today, which is awareness. So how do you feel uniting globally around awareness dates like World IBD Day makes a difference for patients? I know this is very broad, which is why I left it for last. And Angie, let's start with you. I think it's huge. So um, all of a sudden our 250,000 Canadians living with these diseases are 5 million. And as we, we started this conversation, a lot of people felt they were one person living with this disease. And today they're one of 5 million. And today um, we actually hit the streets, a uh, busy intersection, and just um, did a bit of a, a bit of a publicity stunt to raise awareness for the diseases. And the funny thing is, the minute you start talking about it, you're like, so, you know, the, the person will say, "I know someone who has Crohn's, or my sister has colitis," and all of a sudden you find out everyone knows someone with these diseases. But it takes us, you know, talking about it. It takes us, um, you know, initiative to go and open up the conversation. And I think collectively, um, what's happening today around the globe, we're helping remove the stigma. We're helping people feel comfortable talking about something that is typically very private and embarrassing. So um, I, I love being part of this because um, everything we do all year long um, gets amplified today and we'll continue uh, to build off of it. So um, yeah, thanks thanks for arranging for this call. Thank you for, um, I think it was EFCA who um, initiated World IBD Day, and uh, I think it's huge, and we're happy to be part of it. Great, Flavio, what about you? You know, I, I'm very happy to participate in this meeting since I, I, I've been listening these wonderful people talking about all these different researches, opinions, it's so nice. It, it can sound like a cliche, but you know, uh, globally, whenever we put efforts together, we get better results. So it's very important to be united. So, you know, uh, I guess if you, if you get more uh, awareness, global awareness, about IBD, you can favor an early diagnosis of disease, increase the association strength in order to get better access to medication, to advocate for people, and also reduce the, the patient's fear about the disease. So I guess it's very important to, to be united. Great, Matt, what about you? Yeah, just kind of, um going off of what it was just said by everyone you know it's there is such a huge stigma associated with with these diseases and you know i think when people come together to raise awareness and in a way it stigma and it shows patients that you know you're not alone you're not the only one going through it Me personally i when i started opening up about my illness i learned so much about not only myself but about the illness itself and about other treatment options available and in both you kind of miss out on other things so when you start reaching out and you start learning more from other patients you about whether it's a drug option a way of living um you know I, I there were things about the drugs that i was on that i didn't even know until i started talking to other patients who who had it when you come together for awareness you but you learn about the, the disease and the drugs out there um, which i think is really really important in our community or, you know the awareness is a great way to accomplish that Great. David, let's go to you. Um, so like everyone else, I think they're critical, these kinds of things for awareness. 
um, and we're really proud to be part of it actually and I think I say to, I quite often say to people that if there was only one thing that we could do over the next three four five years of course we all want to see the research we want to find a cure we want to ensure people get the support and the right care and the right treatments but if we could only do one thing that will make a universal impact it is getting more people to better understand what these conditions are and the impact they have on people the day I'm able to walk out in the streets here in the United Kingdom and ask 10 people what is Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis and they tell me like that and they get it and they understand it, they realize the implications, that will be a, a great moment for anyone who is having to live with these conditions. We've got a new value that we've just de um, developed at Crohn's and Colitis UK and it's, it's we are stronger together and I think that that is a really um great new value that we're very very proud of because every single person uh, globally has a role to play in this whether it's about stepping out of the shadows um we've been working in this country with uh, three amazing ladies who have been running the get your belly out campaign i think that's done some really fantastic work to get people out there talking about these conditions the more we can all talk about these conditions and it is difficult it is embarrassing but the more we do it the better it will be for all so things like today are absolutely critical and we're really proud and very pleased to be part of it great chiara um, on behalf of EFCA, we're delighted to take part. We find that the purple buildings and the purple monuments is a huge, I suppose, social media aspect has really, really worked for us. Um, and I suppose for me personally as a patient, if one person on World IBD Day realizes that there's a community there, we've all spoken about how important the community is. And I think if somebody who's newly diagnosed realizes they're not alone, then it's worth it because each person counts in each person. Um, in EFCA, a bit like David's, we're stronger together. We always say, united we stand. And I think on World IBD Day, the more we unite and the stronger we'll stand as well. Great, and lastly, Michael. Yeah, I think the heart of your question is about us uniting globally. And, and this one talk has already done a great deal in that regard, I'm so pleased to be in conversation with all these wonderful colleagues around the world. I think we recognize that obviously we live in different countries, we raise money differently, we're, we have different insurance systems and separate research efforts, but the condition itself and the impact it has on the patient is the same across all boundaries, right? Um, and so we really are one community, despite these different environments that we live in. And I think it's enormously powerful for every single patient to recognize that they are a member of this enormous community of people that are struggling and battling these diseases in very similar ways, regardless of the country that they live in. Um, we, we do say five million, but to Flavio's point earlier, and a statement I made earlier, we haven't done enough good epidemiology studies. Um, I'll say something controversial. I bet the incidence is twice that large actually around the world. Um, we just don't even know it yet. But uh, regardless of what the number it is, it is a huge community that has great needs. And the more we band together and unite across international boundaries, the better the whole world will be for our patients. So I'm excited about it. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. And I know my favorite saying is that there's strength in numbers. And you can see that just from this group itself, but also from everyone who comes together on World IBD Day every year. So I couldn't agree with you all more. So that's all the time we have. That's been an hour, which is kind of hard to believe. It felt like it flew by. I want to thank all of our participants today, Michael, Matt, Flavio, David, Angie, and Chiara, for taking the time, whether it's the afternoon, the evening, the morning, who knows what time it is by where you are. But we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And I want to thank everyone who has been watching over the past hour. I know that I've learned a lot, and I hope that you all have as well. It's not too late for you to get involved in World IBD Day. To see all the exciting activities that are planned around the globe, you can visit www.worldibdday.org. And if you want to connect with any of the organizations who took part in today's chat, you can find website URLs and social media accounts listed in the description of this video underneath.
with that being said, have a great day, everyone. And I look forward to us doing another one of these soon. Thank you, Rebecca.